Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Um, I have a cold, so um, if I start coughing, please hold on with the ambulance. I'll probably, hopefully, going to be back to normal soon. In 1929, Lauren Harris, one of the core members of the Group of Seven and the leading art enthusiast, commissioned the young, unknown Russian emigre art architect, Alexander Burikova, to build him a house. As heir to the Harris Massey Agricultural Equipment Manufacturing Business, Lauren Harris could afford to hire an architect of much great, greater prestige and status. OK, so I know what I need to do here with the mic. Uh, prestige and status than Birikova, who was starting to make her, uh, her name for herself in Canada. Educated in St. Petersburg and then Rome, Birikova only became an ar accredited architect in 1931. So this main commission of her career came even before she was technically entitled to practice architecture in Canada. Why then did Harris choose her to, to design her, his house? Why did it mean to what did it mean to design a modern Art Deco house in Toronto in 1929? Why was it the only architectural commission that Birikova ever undertook? How was modernity understood in 1920s and 1930s Toronto architectural circus, circles? Looking at the first Toronto's cutting edge residential project, uh, this paper will argue that by 1930s, Toronto residential architecture was looking forward to Art Deco and the avant-garde rather than backward to architecture of historic eclecticism. Moreover, this case study presents unique example of collaboration where power and gender relationship were negotiated at every stage of the process. Birikova was educated in St. Petersburg and Rome and had worked with Roman architect Asnaldo Fenshini. Fleeing an unstable political situation in Italy, Alexander followed her younger sister, Yulia Birikova, who came to Toronto in 1928 and was by 1929 working and living with other Canadian artists in the studio building, a residential and studio space for artists commissioned and supported by Lauren Harris. It was probably Yulia who introduced her sister, not only to Harris, but also to other members of the Group of Seven. Through them, Birikova became familiar with the architect Douglas Kirtland and John Lyle, and the, and the former became one of the three sponsored, sponsors that she needed to become a member of the Ontario Architectural Association. None of the admitted limited sources that discuss the house fails to mention the name of the house's architect, Alexander Birikova, who came to Canada hoping to establish an architectural practice and became a member in 1930, as I mentioned. Most of the sources express various degree of surprise in, of the fact that Birikova was hired to build uh, and design the house. And more often than not, art historians come to conclusion that Birikova was hired to execute the blueprints while a conception and most of the design work was done by Lauren Harris himself. Interestingly, Jeffrey Simmons, in his uh, extensive history of the Ontario Association of Architects, raises doubts as to whether Birikova was actually the only architect working on the project. He mentions that stylistically, the building is somewhat similar to automotive uh, building, and that more importantly, some of the architectural drawings bear Kirtland's signature. Um, the following will try to explain why Birikova should be fully credited for the design and planning of the house, and attempt to also explain why Harris invited her and not any other architect to work on this house in Forest Hill. The house can be divided in three independent parts. The central tall elevation includes an entrance, a balcony, and a very large panoramic window. The house is located in one of the most affluent Toronto suburbs, now suburbs and then a village, but nevertheless suburb and nevertheless influence, 
Forest Hill and was situated on the top of the hill so that the large window facing south offered an attractive view of downtown to Toronto and Lake Ontario. The two lower wings are symmetrical and feature larger elongated rectangular windows on the main floor and smaller square windows on the top. Remarkably, the white stucco house has minimal decoration. The combination of white and metal recall Le Corbusier and Walter Gropius, but the applied metal decorations of the pine motifs in the windows, the large art deco lantern at, and the rounded entrance and, <clears throat> and incised transitions of the corners point to the art deco style. Inside, every room on the main floor has its own geometric space and shape. For example, the main entrance has a hole is oval, the office is five-sided, the dining room is square, and the living room is a rectangle with um, rounded corners, producing variety in an otherwise uh, unlikely and strikingly minimal interior. The decoration of the house with its expensive materials and superb craftsmanship attention to details and the use of natural motifs points to two interrelated phenomena. Interest in nationalism and creating elite modern living. The layout of the house is both classical and contemporary, although it shows some similarities to Kirtland's creations and also recalls European and especially Italian examples of Art Deco style. Furthermore, not unlike Lauren Harris and his, his fellow members of the Group of Seven, the house designed by the Russian expatriate strove to create a un the unified style of the total artwork. Inside and outside, the decoration was reduced to the minimum and the main accent was on the changing of form and shapes and more ex expensive materials. Given the almost complete absence of decoration inside, the emphasis fell again on the highly accomplished craftsmanship of the staircase railing, decorative ventilation grids, and window frames. Actually, the fact that each room of the house had a different shape, yet all the rooms opened into the main very large space. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, there. Plan. into the main, <clears throat> very large uh, <clears throat> space testifies to be recovers of awareness of and familiarity with constructivism. Perhaps she was also echoing the Russian avant-garde artists, many of whom turned to design and architecture rather than painting and sculpture because they wanted not only to create art but also to create new way of life. Birkova wrote that she admired Rodchenko and Popova for their abstract designs and their, quote, incredible proficiency in juxtaposing forms, end of quote. Birkova, who lived and worked in Italy from 1924 to 29, was undoubtedly aware of the latest styles of architecture and design, including Bauhaus and futurist architecture. With the help of Lauren Harris, she attempted to transplant the radically modern style into Canadian environment. This attempt was unsuccessful precisely because the break with tradition was too rapid and the contrast was too stark. Birukova probably unconsciously borrowed from the futurist tactics of what Charles Stille named the collective action repertoire. Futurists could offer and articulate an incredible array of techniques, methods, and repertoires to propel their followers and admirers into action through visual, oral, and written performances. Birukova attempted to propagate the modern style through the architecture, design, and craftsmanship of this house. She wrote, I hope the house will show people that it is possible to live in comfort, but also in a modernist, contemporary manner, end of quote. Following the success of the Group of Seven, Birukova had hoped to join Canadian artists in setting agendas and to control the discourse 
perception and attitude on and to the issues they raised and defined. Mainly in the case of the group of seven, national landscape, and in the case of Birikova, modern living. Was the house under discussion <clears throat> not just influenced by Italian architecture and Russian art, but in fact manifestation of Birikova's nostalgic feelings for Russia and by then USSR and Italy? It is hard to imagine that the architect did not miss certain aspects of her life in Italy and Russia. Remarkably, her work, if anything, is international and Canadian at the same time. She definitely followed John Lyle's call to make forms more modern and include Canadian elements in the design. The building borrows the best from European traditions and is symbolically connected to the local landscape through leaves and needles included in the design and the use of local materials. As Birikova's subsequent life showed, she adopted Canada and even though she could not establish herself as an architect, she remained there in Canada or perhaps was not able to go anywhere else. Regardless of her private circumstances, however, her only commission is a good example of what Svetlana Boim calls reflective nostalgia. Reflective nostalgia turns longing into a creative spirit, blending the experience of the past with elements of the present. My purpose here is not to inscribe Berikova in the canon of avant-garde architecture and design, no claim that only she should receive the credit for creating such a strikingly modern structure. Often ignored in architectural history, patrons, both male and female, play a role, a role in the final outcome as well. It has been customary in the history of architecture and design to credit the designer and not the patron with the creative rights. That is, if the designer is a man. Things often changed if the designer was a woman. In many cases, she worked with or under a man who shared her credit. In Harris's case, the situation is clearly unique as the designer is a woman who worked for a well-established and highly respected artist. No wonder then that many researchers had, have attempted to credit Harris with at least some responsibility for the design. Harris had planned to move for quite some time since he went to Stuttgart in the late 1920s to look at the modern architecture and his original house was also in Toronto by the High Park area, for those of you who know Toronto. Arguably, he chose Berikova precisely because of her European connections, since he was definitely very impressed with what he saw in Stuttgart. German Work Federation exhibition in Stuttgart, one of the most <clears throat> prosperous cities of the troubled Weimar Republic, commissioned architects to create a modern suburb called Weiss, um, German, and I don't speak German, so bear with me, um, Weissenholm Sedlon, under the artistic direction of Luz, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. 17 architects from Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, and Switzerland created what was considered an exemplary model for modern urban living in 1927. The suburb in Stuttgart was undoubtedly the one which gained the greatest international acclaim and had the highest impact in spreading the new building movement as an architectural expression of modernity. Those involved in the project were among the most important pioneers of an avant-gardism avant from the world of modern architecture. Miss van der Rohe as the artistic director of the exhibition, Le Corbusier, Gropius, Habersmeyer, Sharon, Ma Max and Bruno Todd, Paulsig, Braham, etc. Harris was undoubtedly impressed, impressed by what he saw since his house, with its monochrome white stucco, rounded corners and minimal decor, bears a resemblance to the single family dwelling designed by Hans Sharon. 
Harris's house was striking for Toronto, not only because of the abstract form and modern treatment, but also because it was built for an, <clears throat> for an artist of some authority in cultural circles. In 1931, in Toronto, Art Deco was seen not only in commercial buildings, the window displays of Eaton's and Simpson's uh, department stores, and on pages of design magazines, but also in the traditional suburbs and established and established suburbs. The only other residential project in Art Deco style, albeit more elaborate and decorated, was in Montreal, here, Maison Carmier, in, <clears throat> built by Ernst Carmier almo almost simultaneously with Harris's home. Cormier's was indebted not to the austerity of international style, but to the luxurious and voluptuous Art Deco style of Maurice Dufresne and Jacques-Emil Ruhlmann. Two Ava Crescent, the house of Lauren Harris that Birikova designed was significant not only because it was one of the very rare buildings designed by a European architect, but also because it was the first truly modern residential structure in Toronto. Undoubtedly the result of fruitful cooperation and exchange of ideas between Harris and Birikova, the house is significant because it reversed the more accepted model of woman as patron and man as architect. In 1931, when Birikova had completed the house and became the first female member of the Ontario Association of Architects, instead of increased interest in her work and commissions, there was nothing. Perhaps because of the Great Depression, the commissions never, never came and the architect had to re retain and uh, retrain as a nurse. No mic? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, undoubtedly, the result of fruitful cooperation and an exchange of ideas between Harris and Berikova, the house is significant because it reversed the more accepted model of women as patrons and men as architects. In 1931, when Berikova has completed the house and became the first female member of the OAA. Instead of increased interest in her work and commissions, there was nothing. Perhaps because of the Great Depression, the commissions never came, and the architect had to retrain as a nurse. Despite the Depression, other architects continued to practice, and although their income significantly decreased, they remained active in their field. What then caused Birikova to leave the profession? My argument is that in spite of Toronto becoming more modern and more tolerant, artistic circles were not ready for her radical and innovative style. The fact that she was a woman and did not have roots and familial connections in the country did not help her cause either. To conclude, Lauren Harris's house inadvertently symbolized the drastic changes which would affect both its architect and its patron. As Berikova changed her career and Harris changed his private life and his artistic styles from representational to abstract. And I have a sample here. Um, the house also symbolized both longing for European design uh, innovation and the desire to transplant these innovations to new soil. Perhaps paradoxically, while for Berikova and Harris, the nostalgia was reflective in a sense that they adapted their architectural and cultural experience to create a house that would work for the family, but be modern to reflect architects and art artists' sensibilities. For Torontonians, the house came too early. In this sense, it is possible to conclude that Torontonians read this house as restorative nostalgia, a desire to reproduce style that was not popular in the city and was not appreciated by artistic elites. The nostalgia in the case of Lauren Harris House de uh, derived largely from Birikova's longing for Russia and Italy and her ambition to create a successful architectural practice. Unfortunately, as Simmons notes, 
the Great Depression, the modernity and uniqueness of her com first commission, and the change in Harris's private life and public life prevented her from fulfilling her goals. Nevertheless, as this research has, I hope, shown, Berakova should be fully credited with design and composition of this house. The previous attempts to claim that Harris and or Kirtland were co-designers are not grounded in the documentation available, including the plans of each floor of the house, its elevations, its interior design. Birkova's design represent one of a kind in terms of modernity in Toronto. One that is very modern, but also very luxurious. One that was influenced by European architecture, yet was able to utilize the local landscape and national characteristics. One that attempted to create a paradigm of modern luxurious living. Thank you.